And I'm David Watkinson of AllReality.com, and I'm at the International Remote Viewers Association Conference in Las Vegas, and one of the very well-received speakers was Graham Nichols, who is a premier out-of-body expert who's done many, many, um, had many, many experiences uh, with out-of-body, and uh, we prevail prevailed upon Graham to uh, speak with one of the other speakers, and, and why don't you explain what, what's going to be discussed and who you're going to talk to. I'm going to be speaking with Eben Alexander, and we're going to discuss the, the crossover between out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences, and also look at some of the insights that Eben has gained from his near-death experience in relation to my out-of-body experiences. Um, I've been having experiences of leaving my body since I was around 12 years old and at around 14 I learned to induce them intentionally and I've been researching and developing technology that helps other people induce them since that time. I'm uh, Dr. Eben Alexander and had a near-death experience uh, five and a half years ago back in 2008 uh, that showed me very clearly that everything I'd come to learn about brain, mind, and consciousness over 20 years was false and that uh, soul, consciousness, uh, spirit is something that exists very profoundly in its own right. I wrote a book about my experience called Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife. Well, I'll start off. How, how do you see the differences between an out-of-body experience and a near-death experience in that sense? What's, what are your thoughts on, on the subject? Well, I think they have a lot of similarities. Um, near-death experience, uh, in my view, is simply um, the kind of natural first stage of the death experience, uh, but one in which we come back. And, of course, in an out-of-body experience, one goes out of body, and also, uh, in most circumstances, comes back. So I would say there are uh, a lot of similarities, although the uh, near-death experience, by being a part of that initial transition uh, process of leaving the physical body once and for all and getting back to the spiritual realm full force, is one that often really allows the veil that I think exists between us and our kind of higher soul and the soul that we reunite with uh, between lives, you know, at the time of death of the physical body, um, can be in some circumstances more profound in terms of getting away from this material earth on which we live and even outside of this entire universe. Uh, although that can also happen, of course, without a body experiences. I, I guess in your in your talk last night, you were, you were talking about the whole idea of the brain almost like a receiver um, of consciousness. And I guess my idea when I think of a near-death experience and I think of an out-of-body experience, I tend to think that, that, that as the senses are shut down or, the, or our awareness of the physical world diminishes, we, we can then access that uh, larger consciousness or access that sense of consciousness and then uh, maybe go into something like an out-of-body experience. And I wonder if the near-death experience essentially is when that process goes to its fullest extent and we're able to access that, that full spectrum of consciousness in the most uh, pure way, in a, in a way. Does that resonate with how you... I would say very much that's the case. Um, what my journey showed me clearly, and this was especially a gift of having a severe bacterial meningitis, which I would say is one of the most perfect models for human death because of the way that it primarily attacks and destroys the neocortex, the outer surface of the brain, the part that makes us human. And having spent all that time in, in neurosurgery and thought I uh, uh, having thought that I understood a mechanism of brain-mind consciousness, my experience showed me very clearly that it was completely wrong, that consciousness is something that exists primarily. In fact, I would say consciousness is at the very foundation of all of this material realm, and it's what generates it all and lets it all emerge. And, of course, by being conscious beings, we're kind of living in that emergent realm that consciousness constructs. Um, 
and we're so immersed in it, it's kind of like asking a fish what it's like to be in the water. Uh, but the important thing for people to realize, and a lot of neuroscientists, a lot of people who study brain-mind consciousness, the whole mind-body discussion that's been going on for more than 2,600 years, uh, realize that the model that was so prevalent in the 20th century in neuroscience that the brain creates consciousness doesn't seem to come together at all. Uh, the general thinking was that consciousness is somehow a result of the complexity of the human brain, of 100 billion neurons, and uh, each one with 10,000 connections on average. It's something about that complexity uh, leads to the emergence of consciousness from physical matter. Uh, and yet we realize the more we study the brain that that is not the case at all and that uh, a much better model is really, as you mentioned, the transceiver, or uh, I, I prefer the, the, the filter theories, as they're called, the, that the brain is a reducing valve or a filter that limits consciousness down, and in fact it limits it down to this little trickle of information, which is our conscious awareness here in these physical bodies. Uh, and it creates this illusion of here and now that is very much illusory and I think that that's an important thing to understand but the essence of it for near-death experiences and for out-of-body experiences things like that is to realize what we are doing is by uh, kind of in a sense disconnecting from the uh, our sensory inputs and also from the information processing aspects of the neocortex we actually re can release our conscious awareness to be much more in touch with that infinite universal consciousness. And I believe that's what happens in near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences. And there's a, a tremendous amount of evidence for non-local consciousness, which is that kind of process. And that would include things like reincarnation, uh, the stories of past life memories in children, that kind of thing, that really shows very profoundly that the brain does not create consciousness at all. And I believe that is what we're getting to. And for me personally, it was really a journey of uh, coming from that conventional scientific thinking, you know, brain creates consciousness, uh, what is known as reductive materialism that says that if you reduce everything down to subatomic particles, electrons, protons, quarks, neutrons, photons, then understand the laws that bind them together, then build up physics, chemistry, biology, you can understand everything about the universe. And what I came to realize after my near-death experience is that conventional science of reductive materialism is absolutely mute on anything having to do with the generation of consciousness by the physical brain. Nobody has a clue. It's something called the hard problem of consciousness. And it's not because we haven't done the research or that if we do enough research, someday we'll get there. The more research we do, the more we realize the brain is not creating consciousness. Uh, and I think the enigma of quantum mechanics has been trying to tell us that for a century or more. Uh, that, in fact, consciousness is primary in all of this universe, and there's no way to even begin to say you have a theory of everything or an understanding of reality uh, without a much more robust understanding of the nature of consciousness and what it is. Okay. I, I guess my, my personal perspective on, on the idea is it could, it could be something that's external, that's... Uh, coming in in a kind of filtering process but I'm also interested in the idea that maybe there's some kind of brain entanglement like Brian Josephson and different physicists talk about this idea that maybe neurons or the microtubules the very low structures of the brain could be entangled in some way mm -hmm. and that maybe there's some kind of extension beyond the brain um, so it's almost like the extended mind rather than necessarily that consciousness is completely arising from outside and then coming in. I wonder how you see, for example, the idea of the individual in that context. If it's if there's a the filtering process into the brain, what what is the part that's actually the individual within the whole structure? I guess that gets into the whole idea of of you you use words like soul and spirit. Um and I wonder how you define that. You talk a lot about the definition of consciousness, but I haven't heard you talk so much about what you mean by soul and spirit exactly. So. Well, I think that's a very good question. In my mind, some of the most fundamental questions uh, that I try to address at this point have to do with um, 
with the whole notion of free will and also the definition of boundaries of self. Uh, and uh, that's why I often make a, uh, a point in some of my discussions around these topics that the linguistic brain, you know, the human linguistic brain, that part of us, the little voice in our head, um, is something that I think before my coma I might have even tried to argue was consciousness itself. And, of course, as a neurosurgeon, I realized that the little voice in our head uh, is really just the tiniest part of the brain that generates uh, that voice, that generates kind of thoughts and words and language. And there's a separate region a few uh, inches away that is receptive speech. But they're tiny parts of the neocortex. The neocortex is what modern neuroscience agrees is the part of the brain that makes us human. Um, and I, I think that uh, important to understand that concepts of ego and self, the whole notion of boundaries of self, is very tightly tied to those linguistic aspects of the brain. And so one of the first things I do, for example, in meditation, which is the way that I get back into the realms that I visited in my near-death experience, uh, using, for example, the sacred acoustic sounds that I talked about last night, um, is to let that little voice make a statement of intent, uh, maybe a request, offer up some gratitude, but then that little voice goes into time out because there is far greater wisdom within. And that wisdom within is not tightly bound by the, these concepts of self. I, th I think one way to kind of put a practical example out there, uh, there's a beautiful book uh, called My Stroke of Insight by Jill Bolte Taylor. Uh, she's a neuroanatomist who had worked at Mount Auburn Hospital, part of Harvard Medical School. Uh, and in the mid-90s, she had a hemorrhage into that receptive speech area. That's where our uh, linguistic brain puts together definitions, boundaries, you know, self, non-self, and all the compartmentalization that we try and do through language uh, in explaining and uh, objectifying the world. And as that hemorrhage very uh, precisely, almost surgically, blew away her linguistic uh, center of boundaries and all that, as she was sitting in a chair, she started feeling the boundaries of self expand. She became one with the chair, the rug, the desk, the entire room, with this overwhelming sense of pure love and oneness. And I think that that's very important. I saw the same thing in my journey, but in just a tremendous fashion where, in fact, it parts at the deepest layers of my journey. I became one with the entire higher dimensional multiverse through all of eternity. Boundaries of self completely dissolved. And I think that uh, that's an important uh, feature to understand here is that boundaries of self in many ways are tied to that ego. And the, I'm not saying the ego is not important. It is, the ego is an important structure in terms of survival of the individual in this, uh, in this material realm. And yet it is not our ally in going to these deepest realms. And one of the things that happens in going to these deeper realms is those boundaries of self that seem so apparent and so obvious when we're stuck in these bodies in this life start to dissolve. And I think that's part of the the real magic here is we come in touch with consciousness that is far grander and come to realize that human consciousness is by no means some great endpoint of evolution. Uh, we are only a small step and that consciousness throughout the universe is actually far, far grander than the very limited consciousness present here in the earthly environment. So um, I see that it really, uh, a lot of this kind of discussion and out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, uh, are starting to chip away at those artificial boundaries of self. Uh, even though there, there is certainly some importance to seeing a soul's individual journey. And you had asked about soul and, you know, my definitions of consciousness I went into a little bit last night. And I think just to uh, kind of briefly get into that, I would say soul is the part that we feel by being conscious beings. It is actually the part of us that keeps us uh, from being these uh, mechanistic automatons that modern neuroscience says we are. 
Uh, in fact, when you get into discussions about consciousness, you encounter this concept of what's called the philosophical zombie, which is basically the, you know, the machine that a human being would be. The philosophical zombie uh, looks and acts and quacks just like a normal human being, but has no inner awareness of self. It's a thought model that people use in discussing consciousness. I would say that our soul as the kind of divine uh, uh, connection we have with that one consciousness is what we're aware of in our consciousness here. But it is a part that is intentionally veiled from the knowing of our higher soul. And our higher soul is what we connect with um, when we leave this body at the time of physical death, but we can also come to know that um, in uh, deep meditation, centering prayer. Again, that's why the, the work of sacred acoustics and the work I do with them I think is so fascinating because I believe that that enables our uh, kind of soul, our, our inner true self to come much more into alignment on the other side of that veil that uh, the veil is what prevents us from knowing that much deeper knowing that, that we can know both in near-death experiences, uh, you know, true death experiences, uh, and come to know through other kinds of spiritually transformative experiences, including out-of-body uh, remote viewing and other forms of getting into that universal consciousness. Sure. Well, I, I guess it, in my own experiences I've had... Uh, very profound experiences of interconnectedness, of oneness, of non-duality. Um, one particular experience was uh, connecting with this, what seemed like a fountain of energy, a huge, expansive fountain of energy. I left, lifted out of my body and straight into the center of this huge uh, kind of uh, cascading fountain of light. And as I connected with that, I felt that I was every mind everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then that went even deeper, a stage deeper to the point that I was completely unseparated from anything. Um, so it was a complete non-dual awareness. And I guess in your definition there, you're talking really about that the soul for you is that sense of awareness or that core. I think we both use the word core. I use that in my first book, Avenues of the Human Spirit. I talk about this idea of a that core primary part of the self I guess when you talk about meditation and you think about non-dual um, meditations and non-duality practices there's often this talk of the the point behind the awareness the further you go back to that point where there's nothing but that right. essential point of, of understanding of being aware and that and nothing else and I, I think that's that sounds like what you're what you're getting at and I think you can definitely have that through the outer body experience as well as the near death experience. I think there's often a process. It's kind of like as you go through stages of breaking down that sort of ego self, as you go through that process of kind of unfolding, there's a diminishing of the sense of identifying as me. And as that process goes on, there's this just this pure awareness of a, of a non dual self or a non dual reality. So, right. I think that it's often discussed as kind of the being of, of, of non-self, that uh, uh, complete separation uh, from self. And it's, it's a very difficult thing to put into words, but again, that's why I encourage people to go within. I mean, these answers lie within us all. By being conscious beings, we have access to this. But uh, it does involve, it's, it's a practice, uh, I find that, I try to meditate, uh, you know, two or three hours a day if I can. Often that's impractical. Uh, but to do it on a daily basis and to expect, uh, I would tell people to expect uh, the benefits show up as you go and as you uh, do this year after year. It has a tremendous impact on your entire life uh, and, and how you see yourself and, uh, see your interrelationships, because really this is all much more about interrelationships because all of it is interrelated. All of our consciousness, all of this universe is interrelated. You, by trying to pretend that we can separate things out and isolate them and understand them by isolation is really missing the point that, uh, much more of the knowing and of the wisdom comes from kind of a top down view of how, how this all works. And, and that's what I think we're basically talking about with out of body experiences, uh, deep meditations, near death experience is coming more into, uh, getting that top down view, getting 
more in touch with that universal consciousness, uh, which in my view is very much something that is not a result of, um, you know, some people get, I, I think, a little hung up on thinking, well, consciousness is only something that comes out of, say, the human brain, maybe out of animal brains also, but doesn't really exist outside of that in the physical universe. And to me, that makes no sense at all. To me, the, the best way to see it and, and to make sense of it is to realize that consciousness is primary. And, uh, of course, part of that is realizing that the model that I held before, that the material realm is all that is, and that the brain creates consciousness, and so consciousness is really just an illusion and not something that truly exists, was completely backwards. And since my near-death experience, I've come to see, well, the reality is soul-spirit consciousness. That's the thing that exists. Um, and that the material realm is what is the illusory component. It's a very important illusion. I don't want anyone to think that uh, I'm trying to say that it's unimportant because, in fact, I believe this entire universe exists to support this uh, stage, basically, on which sentient beings can come into manifestation in this realm uh, as part of our, our learning and growing, all consciousness, in a sense, contributing to the evolution of the universe uh, through that process. But uh, to me, the consciousness is something that seems to be very clearly primary. Uh, I know that in, in quantum mechanics, that's what drove a lot of the founding fathers of the field, very brilliant physicists. You know, Werner Heisenberg and Louis de Broglie and uh, Paul Dirac, uh, Werner Heisenberg, uh, even uh, Einstein, although he was kind of dragged kicking and screaming at the end, you know, complaining about spooky action at a distance. But uh, the reality is they, they came to see that the measurement problem, specifically in quantum mechanics, says you really cannot separate the observer from the observed. And consciousness is fundamental in any kind of description of reality. And that's what we're trying to get more into. Sure, and I think within the within the quantum side of things, there's a there's a lot of evidence now more and more for quantum biology and for quantum effects within the brain. I, I remember reading of a study in the University of Milan that showed entanglement between neurons. So I think more and more there's going to be this idea that there are quantum effects, and I, I think within the brain and I think there's going to be more and more evidence for that and eventually I think that will be the the mainstream view really within within how probably how a lot of the processes of the brain arise and I think so a lot of the theories that are combining psychic abilities out-of-body experiences near-death experiences are all drawing upon this idea that there's some kind of extension through a quantum effect mm -hmm. so I think that's uh, that's really the key um, I guess the, the most fundamental thing for me is uh, to keep exploring and to keep asking questions. I guess there's, there is a point where we can say there seems to be some level of uh, another reality and an extension of the mind, but I guess to, to say that uh, we understand the sort of spiritual dimension of things, I feel like we have to keep picking and exploring and um, trying to unravel all of that. I don't feel like after hundreds of out-of-body experiences that I've kind of got to a point where I can categorically say it's like this. I think I keep starting from the position of I don't know, actually, with, with a lot of this stuff. You seem to be very convinced about a lot of the fundamentals of this, and I, I, I wonder why that is. Is there Was there something very specific in your experience that you, you felt that you couldn't in any way... Um, look at in a different perspective is there was there no uh are you are you do you apply any sort of skepticism to that experience for yourself i guess there's also the i guess the the criticisms maybe that people will put and i'd like to hear what you'd say um in terms of the timing are you convinced that the timing of your experience happened when you were in the the depth i'm just being devil's advocate here i know i know that you have an answer for that but it'd be good to hear it yeah i would say basically um i was kind of my own worst skeptic for a long time when i when i first came back from this coma that had really wrecked my neocortex uh, it had destroyed all of my memory of my life before. Everything I knew from before, um, all words, language, uh, any knowing of my family members, knowing of you know, Earth and this universe, all that got deleted on the journey, and that was very important. It gave me 
uh, kind of an atypical aspect of my journey was that I was amnesic for the life of Eben Alexander while I was in coma and when I first came back. I mean, as I was first waking up on that seventh day, uh, you know, and, and kind of struggling to get taken off this ventilator, had no idea where I was. I knew where I'd been. I knew that very clearly. I knew that journey that seemed to me to last for months or years, although it had to fit within seven Earth days. Um, but all my knowing of brain, mind, consciousness, all that stuff was gone. And the words and language came back over uh, hours, days, uh, memories of childhood and all that came back over a week or two. Uh, a lot of my knowledge gained in more than 20 years of experience in academic neurosurgery took up to eight weeks or so to come back to me. Uh, of course, early on, when I would tell my doctors about this incredible experience, uh, they would kind of pat me on the back and say, well, you were very sick, but in fact, we have all the medical records, you know, we have the, the neurologic exams, we have the uh, MRI and CT scans of your brain, we know that your neocortex is being destroyed. So there's no way you could have had any such experience because uh, modern neuroscience says that the neocortex plays a crucial role. It's the most powerful calculator in the brain. And it, it basically is in charge of putting together all the rich details of any kind of conscious experience and memory, according to modern neuroscience. So they told me you could not have had any experience. And that's why I think that my deep in the coma, I had the earthworm eye view, the very primitive, simplistic, underground, unresponsive, that I think was the best consciousness my brain could muster soaking in pus. But then what happened next was the complete surprise with no explanation from modern science, which is all of a sudden it was like the blinders coming off with this pure white light that opened up as a gateway into this ultra real realm uh, that I describe in the book Proof of Heaven. And then uh, layers and layers, dimensions going up and beyond all of that, all the way to the core realm, that sanctum sanctorum just absolutely filled with that overwhelming sense of divine love of the creative source of all. And this brilliant orb, uh, brighter than a million stars, that was there, I thought, as kind of a translator. Um, and of course, all of the, the journey just, it was sounded way too fantastic. So when my doctors told me you cannot have experienced anything, I kind of bought what they were saying. They said the brain uh, plays all kinds of tricks when you're dying. And I assumed, okay, that's it. And so I wanted to record it all and write it all down because I knew I'd had a, an incredible experience. But to me, I thought this is bound to be some lesson about our models of consciousness and the neocortex because something in there is not right. And so I was really my own worst skeptic in a sense. I was trying to explain it as a brain-based phenomenon. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the six faces that I describe uh, in the book that appeared to me at the very end of this prolonged odyssey were so important. Five of them were faces of people who were physically present the last 24 hours I was in coma in the ICU. And that's important because there were a lot of other family and friends who were there the, you know, the six days before that who I don't remember at all as being present. Uh, and that ter served as kind of a time anchor to show me that, in fact, the vast majority of this coma experience had to happen between days one and five. Now, in the book Proof of Heaven, I have nine hypotheses that I put out there that were the more kind of discussed hypotheses because I was going through all this with my doctors, with other uh, neuroscientists, trying to come to an understanding of how this could have all happened as a brain-based phenomenon. Uh, I kept defaulting to my conventional thinking, which is brain creates consciousness. So what does this tell us about uh, models of consciousness and the nature of existence? And we just kept hitting walls everywhere we turned and trying to say it was brain-based and trying to put it somewhere deep to the neocortex, trying to say it happened when I was going in or when I was coming out, something like that. None of those explanations worked. Uh, and of course, just like so many who had near-death experiences, I was absolutely blown away by the ultra-reality of it. Something very hard to put into words, but you don't see with the eyes and hear with the ears. At times you become entire aspects of the experience. I would become other beings to feel the power of their emotional experience. I would become entire civilizations, become entire galactic systems, become entire multiverse, every bit of that as part of the lessons I was learning here, and trying to put that together as a brain-based, you know, was this a hallucination, an effect of the drugs I was on, 
uh, some dream state. Uh, all of those things failed mainly because of the diagnosis, a severe gram-negative bacterial meningitis that all doctors will agree sh absolutely should have killed me, certainly should not have left any room for experience, rich experience, and then memory of rich experience. I mean, that haunted me for years, how that all happened. Uh, but I was really very skeptical of it. Uh, and thought there had to be a brain-based mechanism. But uh, over many months in discussion with other colleagues, we started to realize, well, that ultra-reality. And, of course, then I also started reading the near-death literature. Uh, after I'd written down the first 20,000 words of, of my experience uh, explaining that deep coma journey, that's when I got into the near-death literature, which I'd never paid any attention to before. Because before my coma, I was absolutely convinced the brain creates consciousness. And... Um, so uh, any description of a near-death experience is obviously just a flickering trick of the dying brain. Who cares? Um, after my coma, I completely reversed on that in terms of, wait a minute, there's something very powerful going on here. But, of course, it took getting into the near-death literature to realize that tens of thousands have reported journeys very similar to mine. To me, the similarities far outweigh the differences. And not just the similarities over 50 or 60 years of the main near-death literature, because of course that most of those cases have come up because of modern medical resuscitative techniques where we bring people back from cardiac arrest, which started mainly in the 60s. The good news about that is we now have millions of souls on this planet who have been to the other side and now come back to tell the tale. And the similarities to me were absolutely mind-blowing. And not only that, but then reading the afterlife literature going back thousands of years, Tibetan Book of the Dead, Egyptian Book of the Dead, writings of the ancient Greeks, uh, religious mystics and prophets over time, I came to see we're all talking about the same thing. And the problem is we're using a language that is derived from Earth-based existence. That language is not really at all sufficient to describe modalities uh, of knowing uh, that we come to in, in these kind of experiences that, to me, are very much showing us a far more profound reality, much more real than this one, that is the true dwelling place of our souls. I, I guess the, the, the journey was quite similar for me in terms of the skepticism. I was very uh, skeptical of my initial experiences, but then when I had verified experiences, experiences where I was able to see something outside of the body, which is common in near-death experiences, as you know, but also in the outer body state that you can perceive things at remote locations. For example, in my lecture, I talked about uh, when, I, when I perceived an office room um, at a distance, was able to read the name of the person who worked there and also see the postcode on the wall as I went into the building. Um, that was the first one that really convinced me. But then since that time, I've had many, many more experiences. So there is a sense that these things are real and can be verified in a very solid way. So I think...